Okay, in terms of stuff, deadlines remain unchanged. So exam one, quizzes part two, deadline March 1st. Exam two, quizzes part three, April 5th. Exam three, exam four, quizzes part four, April 26th. And exam five, deadlines at the end of the normal final deadline time. For the paper, uh, draft deadline April 4th, plus our deadline April 9th, emergency deadline April 16th, desperation deadline April 26th, I got a whole bunch of meetings coming up next week. Too many to write down, but I put them on the um, Blackboard announcement. Before ending on to our new stuff, or rather our old new stuff or new old stuff. My name's not on here. friend Descartes uh, talking about his proof of God and we saw that in the fifth meditation. Thank you. We saw that in the fifth meditation he basically presents the classic ontological argument for God's existence. That God is perfect and so he's got to exist because he wasn't um, if he didn't exist he wouldn't be perfect but he is so he does. And Descartes argued that this is unique to God. So at this point, Descartes believes he's established that he exists, God exists, God is not a deceiver, and so in the sixth meditation, he tries to get back where he started, which was his main objective in this case, trying to show that he can have knowledge about the external world. I think that's why. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so that's why he thinks he is. So then he's going to get from so kind of now he's like this. Here's Descartes, he's got his idea of God, he knows he is, he knows that God exists, and he knows that God is not a deceiver, so he's got all that stuff. <coughs> Pixel dust. He's got all that stuff that he thinks that he knows. So what he has to do next is get from just him and God in existence to there being you know, him in the body, there being the world, trees and sun, bad and drawn stuff out there. So the problem again is how does he get knowledge of the external world? Now what he does is essentially an argument by elimination. In the argument by elimination, as we saw before, a couple versions. One is you say there's only like three choices, and the argument by destruction version is you get rid of all those three, so it can't be anything. The other option is kind of the Sherlock Holmes approach, which is you say there's only, say, three possible suspects, and you show that two of them cannot possibly be guilty. Therefore, you infer that the remaining person has got to be the guilty suspect. And that's the method that Descartes uses here. So he considers three possibilities. Possibility one. He, Descartes, is the cause of these ideas. Or in our own case, that in my own case, I'd be the cause of ideas like the backpack and the trees and you know, the chocolate and so forth. The second possibility is it's not him, but it's God. And the third possibility is there's actually stuff out there that exists for real. Um, so, if, from what you talked about how Descartes, he thinks. So if this is his imagination, I just feel like this is his imagination because he's basically thinking of God as an existence and that he's the cause of everything. Same with him. So wouldn't that be he's just like like an illusion? Wouldn't that be an illusion? Yeah, because he does consider what gets him into the the problem is exactly that. He thinks maybe maybe he's just making up everything. You know, that there is really no God, he's just making it up, there is no world, he's just making it up, and it's just, just him. And that's you know, basically the problem he gets himself into. So then he spends the next five meditations trying to get him out of that, get himself out of the problem he created. And what he thinks he's done is, basically he's convinced at the end of the start of meditation two, that he can't doubt his own existence. Every time he thinks he is, so it's like, okay, I exist. So he says, 
is there any ideas that I have that I couldn't be the cause of, that can't come from me, that can be from outside? And he says, yeah, I keep, the idea of God can't come from me, it's got to be from outside, so God's got to exist. And then he says, God is perfect, so he not only exists, he's God is receiver. So, at the end of Meditation 5, he's in you know, the scenario of Descartes, God, maybe all, maybe all the other stuff is not real. But he wants to make it real. So, he first considers maybe he's the cause of all his ideas of everything except for God. But he rejects that, because he says if this was the case, if he was just constantly deceiving himself, um, if this can't be the case. Of course, the problem is, is that he has considered before that he could be the cause of this, and said, yeah, I could totally be the cause, and then now he says, no, I, I can't be the cause of all this. And so critics have said, but, but why not? <laughs> Next, why can't God be you know, where he was in meditation one, where it's just him and God and God is beaming in those ideas. Well, the reason is, if God is just beaming ideas in your mind of things that don't exist, is God being honest? Do you the question? Oh, if God is just beaming ideas in your head of things that don't exist, and he's like, ah, I made me think there's tables and chairs and Donald Trump is president. No, that'd be deceit. So, but God is all good, so he doesn't he doesn't do that. So it can't be God just making up this stuff, because that would be deception, and God is you know, not a deceiver. So it can't be from Descartes, it can't be from God. So if there's only one option left, it's got to be the objects out there are the ones that are, are causing it. So basically he says, you know, his idea of like the backpack can only come from three sources. Him, God, backpack. He says, can't be, can't be me, can't be God, it's got to be backpack. So this point he thinks, you know, he's done it. There he is, in a way back where he was in the beginning. He, he exists, the world exists, God exists, everything's good. But then he still has one problem that remains, namely the delusions, because he can still be wrong. So he began the meditation with the, you know, the idea that his sense is deceiving sometime, and he still believes that, they still do deceive. So he has to reconcile this picture with illusions and mistakes. And as we saw last time, what he comes up with is that analogy to sin. Like this is the stuff we should be doing, and then the big circle of stuff we shouldn't be doing or we want to do. And so Descartes says, you know, if we're, if we're acting properly, we stay within the circle of what we're supposed to be doing. But we can will to do stuff that's, that's bad. And likewise, for making mistakes, Descartes says as long as he just sticks with what he clearly, distinctly perceives, he's, he can't be wrong. But if he strays beyond that to other stuff, then he, yeah, then he can be mistaken. Because then he gets beyond his, his ability to be, to be sure. And so he thinks that that solves the problem. Of course, the only problem is that, well, many problems, but this is a pretty big area. So as we'll see in the near future, he ends up with very little he can be sure about. So we've seen he could say, he exists, God exists, and maybe there's other stuff. So not the worst case scenario, but not the best case. So in the end, he ends up kind of where he began. He says that, the secondary qualities are in our minds. The primary qualities are generally out there for real, but we could be wrong. And then he ends. He thinks he's he's done. And so that did, that concludes Descartes' six meditations. And then he died. He still lived today. Before pressing on, anything about Descartes and his Descartes? He needs more. So, what are some problems, and what was his impact? Now, as we saw, one problem that has plagued philosophers since it came out has been the natural light. Not the beer, but that mysterious faculty. As you might recall in ancient days when you're talking about Plato, 
philosophers have come to this notion that somehow there's this light. Descartes calls it the natural light. It shines on things and shows the truth. And you can think of like your, like in a movie when they shine like a you know magical spotlight on something to make it you know gleam magically. Now the problem, of course, is Descartes distinguishes between natural light and natural impulse, and he says that what's lit up by the natural light we know to be true. What is given to us by natural impulse, perhaps not. The unfortunate thing, there's been a problem that has plagued all philosophers since the camp of the idea of natural light, is you don't have a clear way to distinguish between the two. How do we know that it's being lit up by the natural light of certainty, or whether we just feel really strongly about it? And no one's been able to really lay out how that works. So kind of problem one is, how do you tell the natural light from natural impulse? And Descartes, you know, they're two separate concepts. But in terms of a practical thing, when you're looking inside your mind, how do you tell what's lighting it up? And Descartes doesn't give a definitive answer. Problem two. As I mentioned, we talked about Descartes' principles like the cause must contain at least as much morality as the effect. Critics have said that it's pretty weird that Descartes can say, yeah, I can doubt two plus two is four, I can doubt squares have four sides they can accept a principle seemingly far more complicated. So what critics have said is that given his sort of you know, harsh skepticism, he shouldn't be able to accept the principles he just accepts because he has no justification for them. So kind of the problem here is to get his theory to work, he's got to accept those key principles. Again, like there's no, there couldn't be, uh, there must be as much reality in the cause as the Effect. And the question is, why accept that? And he says they're self-evident, but why think that? So given his degree of doubt, he doesn't seem to have a way, well, a principled way of supporting his principles. And without those principles, his argument can't go forward. Third problem I mentioned before, a key part of Descartes' argument as to why he can't be the cause of his idea of God is he says, well, I got an idea of infinity. And he says, I can't just make infinity by saying, you know, one plus one plus one plus one forever. I can't do that. I gotta have infinity, and I can't create that idea. Critics, including our good dead friend John Mock, have said, yes, you can. You can just start with one and just keep adding one forever, and you get infinity. Now, if Descartes' right, then yeah. If you have an idea of something infinite, you couldn't have made it up. But if Locke and the critics are right, then your idea of infinity could just be made up. And if Descartes wrong, then that argument does fail. Now, the next problems deal with his metaphysics. One, um, one thing Descartes famously advanced was that classical Cartesian dualism. And of course, on Cartesian dualism, one of the classic problems here in metaphysics is what's called the mind-body problem. Namely, how, how does the ghostly and corporeal mind, that is you, that is me, how does it control the body? How does the ghost operate the shell? Now, for Descartes, this creates all kinds of problems. One big problem is this. As you might recall back in the ancient days when he started this, this part about Descartes, he wanted to reconcile um, science with religion. And his solution was this dualism. So the material, mechanistic science deals with physical world. So when you're doing physics, biology, chemistry, etc., you're dealing with the corporeal world. But then when you're dealing with ethics, religion, psychology, etc., you're dealing with the incorporeal world. And so he believed he could make the world safe for religion, etc., and safe for science by having these two realms. Two separate realms. So 
you can have free will here, strict determinism here, you can have you know, mechanism here, then you can have religion, morality, free will, all that stuff here. Now the problem is though, when you have that mind-body interaction, you get what's called the contamination problem. But it's kind of like contamination problem like with food. Like if you if you've ever um, done like health science, one of the things they important things is you don't get your meats touching, your raw meats touching your vegetables. Mm -hmm. That's why you have those separate, clip, uh, separate uh, cutting boards. That's why I have, I've got a cutting board set, I got as a present, that has handy pictures on each one to know what, so that way I don't get my, my meats on my, my vegetables. It's super handy. <coughs> and it has a very nice word rack, etc. Very good. One of my most favorite, favorite gifts, you know, some always cutting stuff. <laughs> I don't want to get you know, the fish death or whatever comes on it. Yeah, so when you're cutting, cutting stuff, you know, a metaphor, you don't want to get like your raw meat on your vegetables. You don't, want to, you don't want to get that in your salad. But of course, if you're having interaction between the two boards, you know, back and forth, you're going to get contamination. And Descartes ran into a similar problem. He didn't get like botulism or E. coli, but in the mind and the body interacting, then you don't have a nice sharp division between the two. They're, they kind of start each other. So if we have free will that controls the deterministic body, that kind of breaks up determinism. Because then you have to factor in free will stuff. And then if our body, if our mind is influenced by our, our deterministic mechanistic body, that gets contamination in this zone. So once you have the interaction going, you get contamination between them. So what he wanted to do was keep them nice and separate. Again, going back to the, the food analogy, keeping the raw fish here and keeping the raw vegetables here so you don't get you know, E. coli in your, your salad. But if you're moving back and forth between using the same knife, you know, cutting them, you're going to contaminate both of them or contaminate the vegetables. And so likewise here, if you have interaction, they're going to get contaminated. So the critics say, basically Descartes said, I want both, so I'll keep them separate. But then critics said they start smushing together, so you can't keep them separate. So, problem. Now, the solution people have come up with in the future was either you get rid of one or the other, strict materialism or strict idealism. Now, turning back to my body problem, briefly, one question was, the problem was this. Again, as I noted, how does the ghost control the show. I mean, you can imagine, think of like a movie version of a ghost. You know, it looks like a person with a transparent. And of course, they'll show like, you know, the hand just goes through stuff, so you can't do anything. And so there is that problem. How does the incorporeal substance control the corporeal? Now, Descartes later believed that it was the pituitary gland when it was discovered. But of course, that doesn't solve it because there's still a question of how the ghost works the pituitary gland. Now, two of Descartes' um, followers, uh, Gounod and Nicholas Malbranche, they came up with the following theories. Gounod came up with what's called parallelism. And the idea is this. And, I'll, and Malvron came up with occasionalism. Now, they're slightly, somewhat different, but I'll, for the sake of, you know, just briefness, I'll kind of smush them together. And the idea, the um, metaphor that's often used is this, that in the case of parallelism, the idea is that as one thing happens here, in parallel, something has happened here. Um, I've read did friend Dr. Bill Leibniz came up with kind of a similar idea. And he used the analogy of, um, Two metronomes. Like if you get them, the little things they use for music. If you had them in two separate rooms, you could have two musicians playing in time, even though they can't hear each other, as long as their metronomes are, are in sync. Or you can think of it in terms of like um, text messaging. You know, you have your text, and your text doesn't actually like fly to your phone. It's that on the occasion that your text is here. It also, the text also appears here. That, to use, I guess, the metaphor, 
all the text you'll ever send to anybody already stored like in their phone, they just appear when you do your phone thing. And so the idea was that whatever's happening here matches up with what's here. So to use another analogy, you could kind of think of it as like, um, there's like a physical hard drive and like a ghost hard drive. And whenever, you know, and the movie's playing, you know, playing from both. Whenever the movie hits like a particular time here, it's also happening here. So when you're thinking of moving your hand, you don't actually move your hand, but your body is moving at that time. It's like pre-scripted to do that. So you have the thought, and it doesn't, that person won Valentine's Day. <laughs> that uh, your hand is moving, but no causal connection. They just happen together. There's also the view that God does the coordination, that you have the thought, and on that occasion, God causes your hand to move. So your mind doesn't control your body, God does all the work. And there are various you know, problems and criticisms of that. So what lasting impact did Descartes have? Well, first, he laid out the requirement for certainty. Namely, that if you're going to be a skeptic, you have to have absolute certainty. Some later philosophers embraced that and said, yes, in order to beat the skeptic, you must be absolutely certain. Other philosophers were influenced by this in a negative sense. They said, although we'd like to have certainty, we cannot. So we have to settle for something less. John Locke, for example, takes that, excuse me, that view. Uh, David Hume takes the view that we, we need certainty, but we don't have that, so we can't have, have knowledge. Second influence, this idea of a universal science to explain life, the universe, and everything is still a thing people are trying to do today. In physics, there's this idea of, um, well, various theories of events, like the grand unified theory, total unified theory, et cetera. But the dream is in physics having one theory that unifies all of physics. Then kind of the next step is unifying more sciences. And sort of the ultimate dream is the one science to rule them all, to they would encompass everything. And that goes back to Descartes, and the dream is still alive today. Thirdly, we're still trying to reconcile science and religion. If you look at the United States, for example, we have, you know, one of the most advanced scientific countries in the world, but religion is still a major factor. So we still have debates over creationism versus evolution. And people are still trying to reconcile the two. Lastly, and we'll see more of this in the future, Descartes considered the possibility of artificial intelligence, basically mechanical intelligences. And Descartes claimed that they would be impossible. You could not have a mechanical intelligence, a purely material. And his reasoning is, is that matter is extended and doesn't think, and minds think but are not extended. So you couldn't have a purely mechanical thinking thing. Now, in theory, you could have a robot with a soul, and then it would, you know, it would have a corporal mind. But in terms of actually constructing mechanical intelligence, Descartes would say no. Now, he was aware, even though he was writing you know, long ago, that people could build very impressive machines. And we'll see more of this in, in the future. But he believed that, ultimately, they could not actually think. And his test was the Descartes test. And we'll see this in the future, but it's the use of true language. And centuries later, a fellow named Alvin Turing you saw the movie The Imitation Game, it's that guy, not Ben, ben Cumberbatch, but the guy who's playing. It, his test was basically this. This is how you run the test. Today we do it with probably a cell phone. You get your cell phone, you text to A and B. One of them is a human, one's a computer. And what you have to do by talking to them is try to figure out through texting which one is the computer, which one is the human. And if you can't tell if they're indistinguishable in terms of their ability to use language, it would pass the Turing test. And you have to say that the computer is now intelligent. 
Now Descartes thinks, again, we can never build a mechanical, purely mechanical intelligence. So mechanically, that would be impossible. But it does leave open the scenario that somehow machines could have souls. I'm not sure how that would work, but you know, not impossible in Descartes' view. And then, of course, Descartes died, still dead today. Before moving on, anything about Descartes' problems or impacts that needs more stuff? Now, eventually, just like with politics, philosophers sort of divide, divide up into philosophical camps, you know, parties, as it were. Now, two of the big camps in epistemology and philosophy are foundationalism and coherentism. And although you know, philosophers, can, you have several that are foundationalists and disagree on particular things, they do have sort of a general agreements. Again, going with the political party analogy, Democrats don't agree on everything, but they have certain general agreements that make them into Democrats. Republicans don't agree on everything, but they have certain things they agree on to make them Republicans, in opposition to the Democrats. Likewise, not all foundationalists agree about everything, but they agree with enough stuff, and they agree that the coherentists are wrong, and vice versa. Now, the motivation of both of these political or philosophical parties is this, the skepticism problem. Now, the skeptic, of course, says you can't know. And one of the approaches of the skeptic is, is to say you can never have an account of justification. So, as you might recall, at this point, kind of roughly put, we would say that you know something, a particular claim, if the claim is true, if you believe it, and you're justified. You know, the JTB or justified true belief model. And where, of course, the skeptic gets their claws into the, this knowledge is the justification. Because if you say, I'm justified because of A, the skeptic just says, well, what justifies A? If you say B, the skeptic just says, Justifies B. If you say C, the skeptic says, well, what justifies C? Off to infinity and beyond. So, what the foundationalists and the coherentists try to do in their own special ways is break this regress. So, you need to find some way to keep it going to infinity and beyond. So, how do we stop a regress? Now, historically, there have been four main approaches. One is this. This is put forth by a fellow named uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein. Interesting fellow. He um, was born to a super rich family, ended up uh, fighting in World War I. He was Austrian. And so it was kind of weird because he was fighting against he, you know, work, you know, was involved with the British, so he said it, probably fighting against fellow students and philosophers, or was kind of weird. And then eventually he made the claim that philosophy was done. He think he, he won philosophy. So he told his students just to go and get, like, real jobs. And one of them listened to him, got a job, and got killed. <laughs> so that was kind of bad. Well, because of, he told me to work in a factory, and the factory was too <laughs> not really suitable for it. And Wittgenstein is super popular, um, mostly because of his personality. And he's kind of fading, fading now. When I was in grad school, he was super big, because, you know, philosophical fads. Now, Wittgenstein said a lot of stuff. And one of the things he said was this about justification. He said, we get belief A directly from B, which is unjustified. That every belief is found, every well-founded belief is found on a belief that's not justified. In other words, this essentially is not solving the problem, but just saying there's a problem. Nothing we can do. So this is really not a solution. So <laughs> that's it. Option two. This is a technique in philosophy called biting the bullet. It comes from the, the expression <laughs> in, um, used in, I guess, sort of the context of medicine, 
or dealing with pain. The idea was this. Back before they had anesthesia, or if it just happened not to be available, and they had to do like surgery, you know, cut somebody, what they would do is have the person bite on a bolt. You might have seen this like in old movies, etc. And a couple reasons. One reason is, interestingly enough, is that the brain only has so many resources. And if you divert resources to other things, it means you hurt less. And research and pain has shown this actually does work, because if you're biting on the bullet, you're focusing on something, and that part of the brain can't be used for pain anymore. Which is why nothing to do with epistemology, but interestingly, they found that if you play video games or listen to music while you're in pain, it really reduces your pain, because the more resources your brain puts into playing the game or listening to music, the less you, you hurt. And they're using these as alternatives to opioids, etc. Um, so the next time you're playing video games, Help that we do research and pain control. Now, getting back to the point of biting, the other thing biting the bullet is used for is, of course, if you're biting something, it's hard to scream. So you don't frighten other people uh, when you're screaming in pain. So, what is it to bite the bullet philosophically? Well, the idea is basically is to simply take something that's awful and just tough it up. Just kind of accept it and just you know bite down on that bullet, just tough it up. So in this case, toughing it out would be this. A person would, who bites the bullet here would say, A is justified by B, which is justified by C, to infinity. And they just say, yep, yeah, it's infinite. They just bite down on that bullet. Now, the obvious problem is, in order for this to work, we would have to not only have an infinite number of beliefs, which we probably could, but we'd have to be able to sort of process that amount of beliefs which we can't. So biting the bullet doesn't seem to work. So that's probably not. Option three, which we'll see in more detail, is what's called coherentism. And the idea is that instead of going to infinity and beyond, you take it in a circle. And the claim is that this will somehow create, they use the metaphor of a web of belief, that somehow if you get it going in a circle, that somehow it works. But as we'll see, uh, as we saw before, running in a circle doesn't seem to, to help. Or so the critics claim. Option four is foundationalism. And we'll see more of this. The idea in this case is is that you have A justified by B, et cetera, et cetera, but you end up with a foundation, a belief that itself doesn't need justification. So any belief you have in this model either connects by inference to a foundational belief or is itself a foundational belief. And as you might, might have guessed, that's Descartes' model. Because for him, you have something like, I think, you know, I am, you know, God exists, or you have know, a foundational thing, or it's something he gets from, from that. And we'll see more foundationalism in our next slide. Before we go to the next slide, though, anything about the stuff so far that needs more? Foundationalism splits into two types, classical and modern. Classical foundationalism works like this. Probably the first foundationalist, although we were those who might have been one before from all the lost writings, was our good dead friend Plato. Plato, of course, had the forms. So knowledge was grounded on the forms, you know them, and that that does it. You know, regress stopped. Our good dead friends Aristotle and Aquinas did a similar thing. Aquinas said there's two types of truth. I mean, true is true. It's not like fake news and alternative facts, etc. 
It's just two ways you get truth. One is truth known in itself, which would be foundational. The other would be understood via an inquiry of reason to the references. So three famous foundationalists would be probably Plato, Aristotle, Aquinas. Now some of the paradigm foundationalism in a modern sense is of course our good dead friend. Oh, can you the last one? Would be our good dead friend. Or Descartes. So as we saw back in the ancient days a couple of days ago, Descartes was trying to do what? Well, similar to the Joker, Batman wants to blow it all up, tear it all down. And unlike the Joker, he wants to create a new infallible foundation. So again, so the sort of metaphor was philosophy and science was like a rickety castle built upon a cracked foundation on sand. Yeah, and he's like, well, this is a mess. Let's bulldoze that and start digging until we find a solid foundation, and then we'll build back up. And as we saw, you know, running quickly through Descartes' you know, solution, he gets from, I think, therefore I am, to God exists, to God is not a deceiver, to generally I can trust my perceptual mechanisms because normally what we see is real. Yeah, there'll be weird circumstances, but we can sort through that. And induction, in this case, would be a source of belief, but not knowledge. So the only thing you should know under Descartes, we saw, was you know the basic principles, and you know things you get through deduction. So Descartes' foundation, now the pyramid, of course, that it drew, in a way kind of gets it wrong. Because with a pyramid, you've got the base, you know, that's the big part, and the top is the small part. But foundationalism, which kind of makes for a weird metaphor, reverses it. Which if you're trying to build a building, would be a terrible <laughs> idea. Although there are some that are built like this just to you know, intentionally sort of create that weird effect. So for Descartes, you have down here at the bottom, you've got the I think, I am. And then of course from that he infers God, and then you get all the other stuff. And then at the top would be like all those other beliefs. So the kind of the correct picture of foundationalism would be this upside down pyramid which again, doesn't look very stable, but there you go. And so his claim is you start off with this indubitable basic principle and then build, 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 build. And that stops the regress because if someone says what justifies that, you would point to an inference. And if they say what justifies that, another inference, another inference. And ultimately for Descartes, it would come down to, I think I am. And that would be ultimate grounding for every, you know, every word. So, given how cool classic foundationalism is, why doesn't everybody embrace it? Well, here's why. One problem, sort of ironically, is this. As my drawing indicates, you really end up with very little knowledge because the only things that end up in the true foundation would be beliefs that are infallible, which you can't be wrong about, or incorrigible beliefs. Now, we often use the term incorrigible talking about, well, criminals, you know, people that can never reform. In this case, it doesn't mean like criminal beliefs. An incorrigible belief is a belief that you never, um, you know, give up on, never, never change. For example, the belief that you're in pain when you're in pain <coughs> would be incorrigible because you can, you can never be wrong or about that, never convinced that you're, you're an error. One interesting debate here is whether that's true. Whether if you're in pain, you would always know you're in pain. Now clearly a person could be wrong about like the degree of pain or the cause of pain, uh, or whether the type of pain they're, they're feeling, they could be mistaken about that. For example, when I was in high school, 
I had a class on anatomy physiology, and for every like terrible condition or disease, the teacher had some real life story to share with us. So there was lots of emotional scarring there. But one of the things that he was uh, talking about was how um, people have a hard time telling like extreme cold from extreme hot. And one of the stories is about a fraternity, and they would do their initiation, and what they would do is they would have like a branding iron and coals, and they have the iron sitting in the coals, and they would tell the pledges they were gonna you know, brand them, and they put a blindfold on them, and then they touch them, but it would, out of their sight, they would have a, a similar brand sitting in a, in a bucket of ice, and they would take the brand, the, the coal brand, and stick it on them, and they would freak out, because they think they're being, being burned, but it's just cold. And so they know that they're in pain, but of course they're mistaken about the type of pain. It's not hot pain, it's cold pain. And so the things that feel very hot also can kind of feel very like cold. Like um, <coughs> like if you're running water and it's super hot, you put your hands under it, it kind of feels like, same as like super cold, because it's painful. Yeah, so it could be argued that we know we're in pain, but we could be wrong about like what kind of pain it is. Is it like hot pain, cold pain? Now, some people have the intuition that we could be wrong about like hot pain, cold pain, but we can't be wrong about pain. If you feel you're in pain, you're in pain. You can't be mistaken about it. You could be mistaken about the cause. You could be mistaken about the extent, but you can't be wrong about being in pain. Now, does, does that seem true? Well, yeah. Because I heard one thing where they were like, um, if you are in pain, remember, just keep thinking like it's not pain, it's just a feeling or something like that. And I tried it one time because it got hurt playing flag football, and it did not work. So I was like, yeah, okay, you can't really deny it. Yeah, it's a good point, because if it's just, you know, you could be wrong about it, you could just convince yourself. I'm not really in pain. I'm, yeah, I tried. It didn't work. Yeah. Yeah, so you could argue that you can't, you can be wrong about like exactly how much it hurts, but you can't be wrong that you're in pain. If you feel pain, you're in, you're in pain. It's not like if you're happy, you always know it. Or maybe you don't, because it's happy. Except if you're happy, you energy, you know, so it could be separate. Yeah, so there are those who think that our emotions were always wrong than we feel. You could be wrong about particular details, but if you feel happy, you're happy. If you feel pain, you're in pain. Now, critics have said, you know, that you could even be wrong about that, that you're a person who thinks they're in pain, but they're not. Like, uh, the example I think of is like when a kid falls, and they, they're crying, and the parent says, you're not really hurt which may be terrible regarding. <laughs> but maybe it's the case. Maybe some people just think, you know, they think, oh, wait, I'm not, I'm not actually in pain. I was wrong about that. And this is mostly a matter of intuitions. The, again, our intuitions kind of go on one hand, yeah, when you're in pain, you could be wrong with the details, but you can't be wrong that you're in pain. Another, another view is, you could be wrong about that. Now, even if we accept that, that you can't be wrong with those things, the problem for foundationalism, classic foundationalism is, instead of like this big pyramid, you end up with just a little bit of knowledge. So for example, given Descartes view, you know you exist, you know that when you feel pain, you're feeling pain, you know that when you're feeling happiness, you're feeling happiness, etc. But that would be it. That would just be, you know, a tiny amount of knowledge. Because even at the end of meditation with Descartes, you still don't know with certainty, because his goal is certainty, we still don't know with certainty that stuff exists. And he, he gives his argument, but we still don't know with absolute certainty. So you end, up, you end up knowing, at best, I exist. When I feel I'm in pain, I'm in pain. When I feel I'm happy, I'm happy. When I feel that I'm sad, I'm sad. But that would be it. So, too little truth. Now, also part of the problem, going back to Descartes, he wanted to you know, save science, but you end up with all the empirical beliefs can't be knowledge, because they're not foundational, and even with Descartes Descartes in, they're not deductively inferred. So all the stuff he wanted to get, he actually did not get. He wanted like all of this, but then he ended up with, with that. Now, one ironic consequence of this is that even though it was intended to be the skeptic, it ends up creating skepticism. How so? Well, 
in kind of the, the following manner. And I'll use an analogy. In classic foundationalism, it's like imagine you're creating a startup and you want the very best of people. Say when you put out your application, you know, your job uh, notice, you acquire, you, you know you need really smart people, so you acquire that everyone had at least uh, three PhDs. And you're gonna need people that um, can, can work you know, around the clock, so you require that they all be Olympic caliber endurance athletes. And you also need people that have you know, established themselves, they all, they all must have completed a successful startup that's generated at least a billion dollars in, in income. Now, if you get those people, will your startup be pretty awesome? Probably, yeah. Of course, they probably won't want to work for you because they already have a billion dollars, so probably not really be working. And so the obvious problem is if you put those requirements out there, how many people are you going to get? Probably a lot. Or not that many. Yeah, yeah. I would get a lot. Well, how many people have three PhDs who are Olympic Well, Olympic everyone had to have it, right? You said everyone had to have it? Well, it, to hire you. So it was like your, your, your job uh, description oh, was yeah, three PhDs, um, Olympic caliber endurance athlete, and have made a creative startup worth at least a billion dollars. Yeah, it's probably zero. It's yeah, probably not zero. that. There's probably no one <laughs> based on that. Yeah, you, I mean, if you did find somebody, they'd be awesome. But the thing is, you're probably not going to find anybody. So, kind of the paradox here is, classic foundationalism sets the standards really high because they want you know, they want it to be awesome, but they're too high, so they end up essentially with little or nothing, and that's the problem. Now, by setting the standard that high, getting back to the skepticism thing, way for the metaphor is that to know something, it's got to either be you know, the self-evident or inferred deductively. So even if you grant that, this skeptic can say, well, what about, is there a room here? And the foundation will have to say, mm, I don't know. Well, are there other people? Uh, I don't know. And so you end up with, you know, true, if you accept the foundationalism, you get a little bit of knowledge. But the skeptic is a field day about everything else. So all you end up with is, at best, I know I exist, and a little bit of stuff, and all the rest is open to doubt. So the problem of the external world, the problem of the minds, all unsolved. Because the standard is too high. I mean, going back to your job description metaphor, if you set the description too high, then yes, if you do get people, they'll, they'll be awesome, but you're not gonna find many or any people who meet those requirements. So, continuing that metaphor, if you're trying to hire people and you find that no one can meet your qualifications for your job, but you still need people, what do you do? Lower your expectations? Right, which is the key to happiness. It's appropriate for Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the old, uh, the Saturday Night Live skit on that. It's like it's about lower, lower expectations dating service. If you're alone, <laughs> Just keep lowering your expectations. Perfect solution. So lower expectations here, marked to you by lower expectation dating service, is moderate foundationalism. So what the moderate foundationalist said was, hmm, no one showed up. Gotta lower my standards. So how do they lower the standards? Well, one thing is this. They still want to keep the foundationalism. So it does still have that model. So they're still going with the upside down pyramid. And what they're trying to do is deal with that problem of the standards are too high. And going with the hiring metaphor, the idea would be like, well, yeah, requiring three PhDs, um, you know, Olympic endurance athlete, and billion dollar startup, too much. Let's, let's water that down that down quite a bit. And so that helps address the criticism that the standards are too high. Now to do this, it rejects infallibility and accepts in its place fallibilism. In other words, the moderate foundation was if you ask them, hey, could you be wrong? They say, yeah, uh, we accept fallibilism that we could be wrong. So what are the features? Well, clearly one is it accepts that you can always be wrong. Now, like classic foundationalism, it is still asymmetrical. Namely, the 
justifying beliefs justify beliefs and doesn't, you know, it's not a two-way two -way street. But it does differ from classical foundationalism in critical ways. The most critical is this, you know, the fallibilism. Also, unlike in classical foundationalism, you can have doubts about psychological beliefs. So you could, the claim I'm in pain, or I believe I'm in pain, could be wrong. And there are no special, in a way it's kind of egalitarian, I suppose, there are no special beliefs that are like elite privileged beliefs that are a certain, almost any belief for them can be basic. Not basic in a bad sense, but foundational. The relationship is justification, and another major difference between moderate and classical is this. The moderate accepts induction. The classic deduction only. And that's a problem because inductive arguments, as we saw back in the ancient days of part one, you could have an inductive argument where all the premises are true, but the conclusion can still be false. So induction always allows false conclusions. Also, modern foundationalism allows coherence to play a role. So basically the strategy was crude to put. Class foundationalism requirements are too high. To use a Valentine's Day metaphor, the class of foundationalist is all of them a Valentine's Day. So the solution, lower standards until you find something that meets them. And so modern foundationalism has lowered the standards. Now, does that work? Well, if it did, I would at this point just say, and then modern foundationalism saved the day forever, you know, we're done. <laughs> Here's the answer to everything. But no. Here's the problem. Whereas classical foundationalism is too strong, the requirements too strict to get us enough knowledge, modern foundationalism is too weak. Because as we saw with the classical foundationalists, their requirement is so high that the clever skeptic can say, hey, do you know this by your own standards? And the classic foundationalists say, no, I don't know it. It's not deductive, it's not foundational. What about, do you know there's an external world? No, I don't know that, because no, it's not foundational, it's not deductive. What about other people? No, I don't know that, it's not foundational, it's not deductive. What about, do you know if Trump is president? No, I don't know that, it's not, but maybe this type of field then. Because the requirement is too, too strong. Now the modern foundationalist says, hey, let's, let's make it weaker. Maybe this can solve the problem. But then they get caught in a, in a different problem, which the problem is this. Since they allow fallibilism, and they allow induction, and they allow that people could be wrong about any of their psychological beliefs, the skeptic can just say, hey, uh, you say you could be wrong, so could you be wrong about uh, the external world? The person would say, yes. Uh, could you be wrong about other minds? Yes. Could you be wrong about Trump being president? Yes. What about you being in pain? Yeah, I could be wrong about that. So what do you know? Um, lots of stuff. Really? Uh, no. <laughs> and so their standards are too, too weak. Because any time you know, the skeptic says, how do you know, they have to say, I, I don't know. And so too weak. And so it creates a bit of a um, paradox. If your standards are too high, you end up with little or no knowledge, because the skeptic can say, hey, does that meet that standard? And you have to say, no, it doesn't. So you know little or nothing. If you weaken it, the skeptic can say, hey, do you actually know that? And you have to say, no, I, I don't. So whether the standards are too strong or too weak, it, it doesn't work. Now, you may think that perhaps a Goldilocks solution would be in order. You know, too strong, too weak, what about just the right? And no one's been able to build that. But in theory, I guess that would be the ideal. If you could find, you know, something that's strong enough that beats the skeptic, but generous enough to allow in enough stuff, that would be the Goldilocks solution. But unfortunately, no one seems to be able to come up with a Goldilocks solution, because either it's going to be too strict or too too lenient. And there may be no way to, to 
get that Goldilocks solution. Now, foundationalists didn't give up. I mean, there are still foundationalists around today. And to be honest, I'm probably foundationalist because you know, the other ones often seem more stupid, <laughs> I guess. It's kind of the thing. It's kind of like my political affiliation. I got to vote, so I got to pick one party, so I pick one because yeah, I hate it the least, <laughs> I suppose. Not because I like it, because I hate it the least. Which is not a great reason to choose anything, but that's probably why I'm a foundationalist. It's the least stupid of the, the options. That's terrible. So what if you don't want to be a foundation? So what if you say, that's stupid and too stupid, I don't want to be part of that. Now, another option, if you like spiders, is coherentism. Now, like foundationalism, there are two brands of this. Classical and then like new coherentism. The early coherentists, the classics, they were dealing with a question of, you know, Truth. Now, for them, well, I guess let's go. Let's go back to the kind of the old version of truth, the common sense version. Kind of the common sense version of truth is that when you say something, it corresponds to reality. It's the correspondence view of truth. So if I say the backpack is on the table, that means that my words, my claim, somehow corresponds to backpack on the table. Which is kind of our common sense view. We, we are saying, our words are saying what is, as opposed to you know, what is not. So true is saying what is, untrue, what is not. Now the coherentists, oddly enough, rejected that. They said truth is not correspondence. It's not that you know, your words match the world. Then what is it? Well, their claim is, it is a matter of the absolute system of knowledge. In other words, truth is not my words matching the world, so it's not like, you know, world is you know, world, therefore true, or words not matching the world, therefore false. Their view was that truth is a matter of these integrated absolute poles. Every true belief is entailed by every other, other proposition. And so basically you build like this system, which is kind of counterintuitive. Kind of now then, later, in the 20th and 21st century, it always really feels weird saying 21st century, because it sounds like it should be more like cool, like more sci-fi, like maybe moon bases or something. But all we get is Facebook. The prominence moon bases and yeah. So disappointed. These were uh, Quan, whose dad, Sellers, dad, I think, Harmon, I think he's dead. I met him. Lehrer, Bonjour, met them. I think they're dead now. Not because I met them. <laughs> Not because I'm never crying here. Uh, they just were super old when I was in grad school. Mm -hmm. I should check them. Sometimes people hang in there a really long time. They um, reject that coherence theory of truth. In favor of what? Well, instead of saying, you know, it's coherence that gives us the truth, how all these things fit together, they adopt a theory of justification. So the question is not, like, what is it that makes this claim true, but what is it that justifies it? And their claim is a belief is justified by the entire system of beliefs, which is why I got the spider web here. In fact, they use the metaphor, the web. Of belief. So, how can I sell coherentism and make it seem you know, kind of good? Well, here's my sales pitch. Now, foundationalism, to use a metaphor, is like building on Earth. The idea, of course, if you're building on you know the Earth that's got gravity and stuff, you do have to have a foundation to support your structures. And if you don't have a foundation to support your structure, if you just build it like on sand or a swamp or something, it just collapses. So that's a decent metaphor for that. Now what about getting to coherentism? Well, coherentism's model 
it can be seen as like a spider web, but in a way that kind of breaks down because spider webs do have to anchor to something. You know, they have to be connected to, to something. A better metaphor would be building in space, like the space station. Now, if you're building in space, what do you attach your building to? In a way, it's kind of a trick question, because the answer is, yeah, space. <laughs> yeah, so you have like a module, and you just park it into um, you know, a, a, uh, an orbit, hopefully a stable orbit, so it doesn't like crash and stuff. And then what you do when you're building on it, you just bring up more stuff and just keep connecting it. And so there's no foundation. It's just every piece fits together with every other piece. And it forms a single structure, a single space station, not with any foundation, but by all the pieces sticking together. It forms, hopefully, a coherent whole. And you can build massive structures in space that way. So the metaphor is there, space building. But what would be a way to kind of begin to try to sell it in terms of like it making sense? Well, my usual sales pitch is this. If you think of those um, you know, police procedurals, criminal investigation shows, they generally don't find, except in dramatic, you know, really dramatic ones, they generally don't find like one piece of evidence that just proves everything. Otherwise, it'd be a pretty short episode. But typically, what they would do is they would find bits and pieces of evidence, like they find the person's DNA, they find uh, the person's prints on the weapon, they find the person has a motive, they find the person's alibis don't hold up, they find witnesses. And the idea is, is that all these things support each other and support the claim that the person is guilty. So there's no foundation in a way, there's just all these interlocking pieces of evidence, all these claims that all fit together. And the way to make the case is they create a coherent case where all the pieces fit together, supporting the claim the person is guilty. And so it's this web of belief. And so kind of the selling point of coherentism is, is that. You put together a coherent that narrative where each piece fits together, thus justifying you know, the key claim. In this case, the claim of guilt. Now, if of course this was the one true view, at this point I would say coherentism has saved us all. Here's the answer to everything. You know, we're done. But as you might imagine, now, the fatal objection against it is interesting because the best example of the most fatal objection against this came out long before <laughs> this theory came out. So in a way, the objection was already there before the theory even existed. And here's the problem. It's what's called the isolation objection. And here's the gist of it. One illustration would be if someone is paranoid, but very coherent in their paranoia, what they could do is they could build a perfectly coherent paranoid world. I think it was it Mel Gibson film, it was a conspiracy theory, I think. And they could have a perfectly coherent theory of conspiracy where everything fits together beautifully, but none of it's true. It, it doesn't attach to reality at all, which is certainly a possibility. People who are, who are extremely paranoid can have that, that happen. Now, what about an example that doesn't involve insanity? Well, here is an example. During World War II, when the Allies were preparing to invade, you know, basically France, the, you know, the Nazis knew the Allies were coming. They couldn't you know, hide the fact they were but what they wanted to do was try to conceal from the Nazis where they were going to land and exactly when, because there's a lot of coastline in Europe. And the Germans only had so much stuff. And so if you could convince them that we're going to land here and we're not, they're going to put some stuff there and waste some stuff. 
So what the Allies did was pretty brilliant. In make a long story short, in England, they created ghost armies. Unfortunately, not like cool ghost armies, like a ghost, but fictional armies. So they would they would get inflatable, you know, basically make balloons in the shape of tanks and aircraft, and they would have people, you know, using radios, pretending like they were, you know, this unit. And they would you know, have all this radio chatter for Germans to pick up, up on, and they would do you know, more subtle things, like they would put out advertisements for you know, workers to work in an airplane factory and advertising for jobs for people to drive airplane parts to a particular place. And so they create all this, you know, all this web of evidence for there being this big army. Kind of the um, most interesting and kind of, you know, I guess kind of the disturbing thing they did was this. They um, found somebody who died. I don't think they killed him. But they dressed him up like a British officer and put a briefcase on him with these secret invasion plans. Now, they obviously just couldn't throw like invasion plans in the ocean and have the Nazis find them and say, hey, you know, this clearly must be true. So they created like an entire, you know, plausible persona down to the finest details. Like the person's wallet, they put in like ticket stubs, um, membership cards, all the little debris that people pick up in normal life. They even made a fake letter from, from the bank saying that he'd been overdrawn in his account and stuck that in his pocket so it, it seemed plausible. And they took the body and dumped it off the coast of Spain because Spain was neutral but you know, friendly to Nazi Germany. And so that way the Spanish found the body in the briefcase and gave the information to the, the Nazis. And so the Germans believed the attack was going to occur where it wasn't. And that disinformation helped the landings be successful. And so everything was perfectly co coherent but totally false. So the fatal objection against coherentism is you can have utterly coherent sets of belief that are utterly untrue. Now their usual response to it is, well, there are other beliefs that can go in there to show that they're, they don't cohere, but that's a bit of a problem. So it does make sense that consistency would be necessary for knowledge. If you know stuff, all your knowledge has to be coherent, because it all has to be you know, true. But it's not sufficient. Just because something is coherent and consistent doesn't mean it's true. I mean, a well-crafted conspiracy theory, a well-crafted lie, all the parts could be utterly coherent and consistent, but they could all be utterly untrue. <coughs> so, coherentism doesn't solve it either. No surprise there. Now, one of the most recent ones is, there is a view called uh, contextualism, which um, tries to argue that you know stuff based on its, basically its social context, that knowledge is based on justification and social groups. Now, as you might imagine, the critics have said the obvious to that. Uh, just because your beliefs are accepted by your social group doesn't mean that it's true. Because then conspiracy theories would be true because they're acceptance by the groups. And if you had people who are like, you know, white nationalists, their beliefs would be true in their group. So that one doesn't really work either. Before heading away from coherentism to a good day friend John Monk, if it needs more A little background for Locke. He's dead. Uh, been quite a while. He um, went to Oxford, and his friends described him as someone who was never satisfied and was always looking for you know, answers and was not willing to accept the ones simply given to him. He was quite active in public life. He helped uh, draft the constitutions for the Carolinas, North, South, and of course, East Carolina, the secret Carolina. And one of his main motivations in terms of political philosophy was, of course, the English Revolution. And he claimed that his two treaties on government were written to justify the revolution, but probably not, because he was working on it long before the revolution. And he wrote a lot of stuff, the two biggest being, again, the two treaties on government, 
and the other being uh, an inquiry into human understanding. So what was he up to? Well, during the time Locke was walking, it's considered by the people who describe themselves as an age of enlightenment. And he believed that he was part of that. He was going to do some enlightenment. Now, his motivations and tasks are very similar to Descartes, but more modest. Like Descartes, if you were to ask Locke before he was dead, is philosophy, is science in disarray and messy and cluttered? He would say yes. So during the time period, you know, people like Locke, Descartes, Hobbes, etc., they believe that people have been doing a lot of stuff, but it was it was a mess. So they all kind of agreed on that. So they saw their task as kind of clearing out the debris. Now Descartes had a kind of total destruction approach. He was going to bulldoze everything and just you know, get rid of everything, get to a foundation. Locke was more modest. He saw his task as clearing away some of the underbrush and debris so the master builders, not the legacy master builders, but people like Newton, could go and do their work. So Locke was much more modest in his approach. You know, Descartes you know, saw himself as the person who was going to construct everything, just you know, tear it all down, build everything himself. Locke was a person who kind of shows up with a machete and says, I'll help you clear out that underbrush, and then the people with real skills can go and start building the building the house. Also unlike Descartes, he didn't think we could get certainty. So if you ask Descartes, certainty or not, Descartes um, took that to you, saw without it. Yeah, Locke said, well, we do want certainty, but probably can't get it. And he uses a metaphor. He says, although we want the light of the sun, all we have is the light of a candle. Basically saying that our capacities are quite limited, so we're not going to have this certainty. It's not that he doesn't want it. You know, if someone said, hey, here's some certainty, he'd be like, yeah, thanks. But it's that he thinks we just can't, we just can't get it. So what is his method? Well, he adopts what he calls an historically plain method. Why? Well, because it's plain. And also he thinks that what he does is he traces back ideas to their origin. So putting in our, him in our uh, taxonomy of philosophers, he would be an empiricist. So he believes that whatever we know about the world comes through our senses. And whatever is in here comes from out there through, through the senses. And Locke thinks that if we trace back the origin of ideas, that's where we'll find, you know, find the justification. Now, as we saw, one of the big battles between the rationalists and empiricists is their picture of the ideas. The empiricists, like Locke, say nothing's in there. When we were born, day zero, tabula rasa, blank slate. The rationalists say, you're already pre-stocked with all kinds of ideas. Again, going with a, a close this usual metaphor, for the empiricist, it's like computers used to be back when I bought my first computer, the Commodore 64. You plug it into the TV, you turn it on, you get a cursor, because there's nothing installed. It's you know, a blind slate. And you've got to go, if you want to do something, you've got to load programs or type them in. For the rationalist, it's kind of like the, the computers and phones you use today. Namely, you buy a laptop, it's already got all kinds of stuff in there, preloaded in the factory, so it's ready to go. Now, rationalists disagree about how much you get in there, its exact content, how much you know of it, like Plato. You know, Plato says you get all this stuff in there, but you're not aware of it until you get reminded. Uh, Descartes believed you could go and look around, you will find, find it, like the idea of God. Uh, Leibniz, as we'll see in the future, says, well, you really have to go in and do a lot of work to find these things. They're in there, but you've got to work for it. So have a good rest of the day. And remember, tomorrow is Discount Chocolate Day. So, <laughs> day of shop. So have a good rest of the day, and I'll see you on a Tuesday. <laughs>